Welcome to Music Matters 2020. I'm your host, Jason Tram. Thank you for joining us for the launch of our new video podcast as we explore the important topics and events happening in the musical landscape today. We will look at these through the eyes of distinguished members of the artistic community. Like many artists, I wear and have worn many artistic hats in my 20-year career. As a conductor and music director, I have worked in the field of opera, and I've also worked with many choral and symphonic ensembles. I'm currently a professor at Seton Hall University, a church musician serving as the Director of Music Ministries for the Ocean Grove Campment Association. I've also served as a public school music educator and am currently in demand as an artistic consultant. I have loved the diversity of the music that I've been surrounded by and the literally thousands of artists and audience members who've joined me in these endeavors. It's my interactions and conversations with these respected colleagues that have always I've found particularly rewarding and inspiring. On Music Matters 2020, we pull back the curtain and you get to join in the conversation as the broad artistic community grapples with issues that have never been faced before in our lifetimes. Please like, share, and subscribe to us on YouTube and click on that bell for the most up-to-date information on upcoming guests and topics. Please share this podcast with friends and colleagues, and they can join in the conversation as well. We encourage you, our audience, to use the chat feature during our live broadcasts, and make sure you join in. Thank you so much for joining us, and we welcome tonight Francisco Miranda, a claimed pianist and conductor, Francisco Miranda, a New York City native, uh, born and bred, and we're delighted to have him with us tonight. Jason, it's great to see you. So tell me about me um, about your development as a pianist. Um, I hear you're the son of a professional pianist. So tell us about that. Yes, he was a uh, classically trained Chilean pianist, Mario Miranda, uh, and he was a, a student of many, many uh, teachers, including uh, Walter Gieseken. He had a uh, class all about Debussy's music. Uh, but the one t- uh, teacher that stands out, I think, more than, than Gisiging, for my money, was Claudio Arau. Arau, uh, born in Chile, had uh, lived in Germany, moved to Germany at a young age, and studied with Martin Krause, who was one of Liszt's, Franz Liszt's uh, last pupils. Quite, quite a pedigree. And... Yeah, and then if you go back even further, the list uh, was taught by Carl Czerny, and Czerny was taught by Beethoven. So that's quite a, a nice I'm little a musical lineage. I'm a huge fan of the Beethoven uh, sonata, so that's really incredible. Yeah, the last sonata is, is probably the, the one that uh, is untouchable. So tell me what it was like. Did you meet Mr. Arau, Maestro Arau? I did. I go to his home uh, with my father uh, for lessons whenever he had lessons uh, it was interesting his house was in uh, by the lake near Douglaston in the park manor of uh, um, uh, and his studio when you come in uh, to the left you go down a set of stairs and the studio was so huge it's it's like a house uh, uh, with tall ceilings and filled with books and architecture from places all over the world. And at the end of the uh, of that uh, of his uh, 
that studio was the uh, Steinway that he uh, practiced on that was given to him by Steinway. Wow. Steinway. So what impact did that make on you as you started your piano being in that fertile ground of musical excellence? Well, like I climbed up uh, onto the bench when I was about five or six years old. And my father heard me play some melodies and he often to come. I think we lost our you, our Skype feed uh, from Francisco. Um, hold on, we're connecting as we go. We lost the feed from Francisco's question from his on his line. Um, As we're reconnecting with Francisco Miranda, be sure to find us on YouTube on Jason Tram and uh, join us on our YouTube channel as we're building up our subscribers. And we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we are at the whims of the internet these days and all of us are on it, but he'll be back with us shortly. And we'll dig into this wonderful pianist conductor. And there is Francisco Miranda. And now you're blue. <laughs> oh, good to have you back, Francisco. Thank you. Thank you. So we nice were talking about um, that fertile ground that you grew up in, some around some of the greatest, uh, greatest people, greatest artists. So how did that influence you growing up and your music making? Well, uh, my father, as I said, had uh, studied with Arau and that had a profound uh, influence on me. And then when I began uh, studying at the prestigious Greenwich House Music School in in the West Village here uh, in New York City with Maestro Germán Diaz, Cuban pianist, he was kind of more of a second father to me and really began to very patiently, pretty, pretty much gave me the whole Beethoven, Journey, Liszt, Krause, Arau, Technique, and um, it was very gratifying. And uh, there was a, you, you, I could tell how things just actually began to, if I was taught, was something that Arau always emphasized, and was to keep the whole body relaxed. And if you do keep the body relaxed, um, you're able to be in contact to what the music is dictating to you. And if you, if you suddenly, be, suddenly become stiff, the whole, the emotional current, the musical emotional current won't go through into your hands. That's very good and advice. I know it's the same for a conductor and a singer as well. Attention is the enemy of uh, good performance. So that's very sage advice. Absolutely. You know, vanity. He said is the is he said is the most terrible thing for an interpreter because if you have something to say that is unique, you don't need to impress anybody. You've got your message. That's it. And if they like it or don't like it, that's pretty much irrelevant. That is a, once again, sage artistic advice, and we take that with us wherever we go. So tell me about um, your favorite repertoire. What are some pieces you love to play? Well, I was immediately attracted to the music of Claude Debussy. Debussy was pretty much like music from another planet. And I got into also Ravel. Uh, but uh, my teacher kind of pulled me back, pulled the reins back a little bit, and started pretty much making me work the basics with exercises, even Liszt 
uh, created uh, technical exercises for the fingers, for each of the fingers, and to develop the dexterity. Uh, Bach and Mozart, of course, and then I got into Beethoven and Chopin. His etudes, uh, Rao always used to say, were the Bible for the pianist, uh, because they pretty much contain everything that you need to do to develop. But I, what I do is I go back to the pieces I've learned and just to practice and instill, you know, and to maybe discover something, even something new that I have, and to keep on it. So now, uh, how about, um, I know you're steeped in the European tradition. How about some, uh, do you have uh, influences from Latin or Spanish music? Oh, yeah. Uh, I got that, I got uh, into that uh, uh, in just pretty much the turn of the, of the century. Uh, we were doing a lot of Latin um, American music, some Brazilian, Argentinian, where and Chilean, where my parents are from, and I really got into, uh, you know, try to get my hands knee deep into the music, and I actually went to Indiana University in Bloomington, where they housed a lot of the music that was there, and I was able to get my hands on a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of musical gems out there that are not played. And one of the goals I want to do between now and, uh, you know, next year or the year after is to put together a couple of recitals solely based on the Latin American piano music. You know, music that you haven't really heard, but it's like, wow. I mean, there's even music from uh, a guy named Wim Statius Muller who used to teach at Juilliard, and he was from Curacao, and he created these Antillian dances, which are just absolute gems. I think it's so important to explore so, new music and to delve into new pathways, and especially when you find a connection with it, a strong connection. I think that's a really great project, and I look forward to being in the audience for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm looking forward to uh, Herman's uh, brother, Alfredo, uh, who's Cuban, was a was a composer just celebrated his 102nd or 103rd wow. birthday he said, yeah and uh, he wrote a piano concerto which, uh, and I recreated it and uh, I'm in talks with some people to see if we can uh, make this uh, concerto uh, a realization. Speaking of concerto, I'm going to um, transition this now. How did you become? Now, I, I understand that you've had um, you've you've not you're not only an accomplished musician, you've also had a career in the business world. Is that true? Mm -hmm. What is what's it like spanning yeah. both worlds? <laughs> well, it was essentially just uh, just earning the living. I was uh, from. 1983 to 2008, I worked at uh, on Wall Street. Uh, worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, I was an examiner. I was a regulator. I was an analyst. Uh, but my heart was always with music, so I pretty much used the uh, the, uh, the the day the day job to, as to way to make a living, so that I can study more. But you could say that uh, Wall Street and uh, music was sort of a left brain, right brain collaboration. So you would certainly identify with Charles Ives, who was a very successful um, insurance salesman and um, composed some of the most groundbreaking music in American history in the turn of the century. Yes, he did. That's right. Uh, now, recently in your in your musical career, yeah. you've you've uh, delved into conducting. So, what's it like going from a pianist to a conductor, and what drew you towards conducting? Uh, it was just something, you know. Someone always used to say, you know, in this business, you got to wear many hats. And knowing that being a concert pianist, a solo pianist, uh, I realized that it may not. Uh, be the kind of dream that I was uh, hoping it would be. So I decided to kind of explore uh, into other fields. And conducting was one of the things that just kind of drew me. And I said, wow, just to have a stick and to be able to direct, you know, a hundred piece orchestra, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So I, uh, I started to 
get into that, I remember the very first thing I did was in Greenwich House. I conducted Vivaldi's Winter from the Four Seasons, and then did uh, the, the two piano C minor concerto of Bach Das Orchestra, and it uh, was a it was a blast. And then I got to meet a um, friend, director of the Lit the symphony, who, who uh, does these summer uh, festivities, uh, and he got me into conducting uh, when I got the uh, Elvira Dramatic and Concerto from the piano. Very special indeed. You get to uh, use both worlds. You get to be the soloist with an orchestra and the maestro. What an incredible uh, opportunity. Uh, I yeah, I got to got to see what it was like to be, uh, you know, Daniel Barenboim, even Bernstein. 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 Yeah, it's extremely difficult. See, it, it it taught me. I mean, I made many mistakes, but it taught me that you really, really, really have to know the score both inside and out, not just. You were following in the footsteps of the man who premiered that work, so that was they were certainly done by the composer. They were vehicles to promote the composer. Oh yes, right. Exactly. So now I, I oh, met you doing that? opera work. So tell me about your attraction to opera and the company you helped found. Well, it, um, I certainly helped in, uh, um, in, in making the, the, this company uh, broaden its horizons, if you will. It just happened that the, during the lowest point of my, of my work career uh, in 2008, during the recession, uh, I was let go from um, exchange, and I got a piece of advice uh, from a good friend, and just said, "Follow your heart, follow the music. It's going to catch up with you, and you're going to do something pretty special with that." And I've always loved opera from the from the beginning. I remember uh, I was uh, at a rehearsal when I was 12 years old, a dress rehearsal at the Metropolitan Opera with James McCracken, Cheryl Mills, and Teresa Zilisgata doing Verdi's Otello. And that had a, uh, had a prof uh, I would say, a profound impact. And I got to see many operas since then. Uh, and it just by chance, I was doing um, collaborative uh, piano work with opera singers at a sushi bar of all places in the West Village. And in came this Bulgarian uh, bass singer who sang at the Metropolitan Opera uh, by the name of Valentin Pechenov. And we introduced ourselves, this was back in 2009, and uh, we got to talking and and one thing led to another and he, one day he just whispered to me that he wanted to start an opera company and invited me to, to join. And that's, that's essentially incredible. how I got started. Um, with opera and with um, with starting companies, and um, I, I met you through that that working with that company and meeting Val, uh, Valentin Pechenov, wonderful bass baritone, a wonderful artistic presence in New York City, and voice teacher, and mentor, and um, lover of sushi as well. I've had a couple of meetings where we've had sushi as well. What a uh, an interesting man and. Um, and I, I've heard he is on the road to recovery. We're delighted to hear that he was ill um, recently, but he is now on the road to recovery. So we're all very happy to hear that as he resumes his place in the cultural identity of New York City. Yes, if, if, if I can add something that just, uh, that just came to mind. Uh, um, his way of teaching, the, it was an immediate attraction. And you know, you, you've seen many voice teachers do it, but with his teaching, it was parallel to how I was taught uh, as a pianist and how Arau taught my father, but with the voice. And to have the voice relaxed. And, you know, there's, there's, you have that similarity. And, and I thought, now this is a teacher that really knows how to teach uh, singers how to sing. And he's had many... Uh, successful singers uh, with uh, artistic careers. I have a, a good friend, Lawson Anderson, who won the uh, the Listener competition, the George London competition, and is now uh, in Leipzig with a three-year contract with that opera company. Uh, and there's another uh, tenor by the name of Arthur Spiritu, who 
is now in the Philippines. Uh, but uh, before the uh, the pandemic, he was uh, singing in, in uh, Zurich Opera, Leipzig Opera, and Asia as well. So there are many, many, you know, all because of, of Valentin's uh, Well, those mentors teachings. are so important in the, uh, in the development of young artists and development of us as colleagues. I know by working with people like, like Valentin and yourself, um, I find so much in my own conducting that I change and I bring out when I, when I work. I, every time I, I form a new collaboration, I always learn so much. That's what's so fun about this. makes this career so interesting and ever you never stop learning. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's 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 almost like painting. You know, the one painting is never this. It's never the same. Discover layers another. that you never knew existed. In fact, Arau uh, had relayed a story where in Italy, back in the '60s, they were very very. The audience was very very superficial. You know, they used to go in and out of the uh, auditorium, and they just weren't very interested. But in the '80s. Uh, it was completely different. I mean, you could hear a pin drop, and it would come back. And they said, you know, I didn't like the way you, you phrased this. It could have been done a lot differently if, if you know, it would be a bit better. And they were asked, my God, were you offended? I said, no, 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 I love it. I mean, you learn something from that. Well, the audience is the ultimate discerner of taste, isn't it? We certainly have to always be cognizant and give our best. I know as, as artists, we're always um, preparing and working, and it's it's not real until we get in front of an audience, That for certainly for me. Absolutely. Teachers can always learn something from students and vice versa. <laughs> So tell me, Francisco, um, what was your, how would you describe a, a busy work week in the life of Francisco Miranda pre-COVID-19 pandemic? Hmm. Well, I uh, used to uh, have a lot of gigs and coachings. Now, I, I don't teach vocal coaching because that's not my expertise. My expertise has now become more of the interpretation of whatever it is that uh, singers are doing, whether it be an aria or an ensemble. Um, I've also done a lot of arrangements, you know, with you, for example, uh, and uh, that's been a, a fantastic thing. I've also, uh, you'll have to excuse me, there's a lot, there's the applause at the 7 p.m. applause for the uh, essential which happens every night. Lately, I've been uh, doing a lot of arrangements for four pianos. I've met three, three wonderful pianists that um, uh, we did a concert last year, and we I was able to put my arrangement uh, expertise into play. We did uh, some tangos. I did uh, an arrangement of Gershwin's American in Paris, a uh, work by Philip Glass, uh, and this year, unfortunately, we couldn't do it because of the pandemic, so we postponed it until next year. We're going to be doing, uh, including Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. So what pounds. are you doing now during pandemic? Oh. We're, in, we're in quarantine and lockdown. Um, it was nice to hear the, the 7 o'clock salute in New York City to the, uh, the workers, the essential workers, and those, mm -hmm. and those heroes in New York. So tell me, what, what, do you, what does your week look like now? What are you working on these days? Well, obviously, I'm, um, it's uh, finding, you know, coaching uh, work is a little more difficult uh, doing this online, but uh, I've uh, delved into doing projects um, with orchestras that are uh, doing virtual presentations. Um, I've also so, uh, been doing uh, um, recordings uh, through uh, GarageBand, which I've uh, been learning. Uh, X. and doing more of an orchestral accompaniment through my keyboard back there uh, and to allow the singer to be able to have uh, more of an orchestral um, uh, I don't know how to quite say more of an orchestral feel uh, rather than just the vocal the piano vocal score and uh, that uh, has been 
pretty much been occupying. Well, these, these days, technology has taken such a huge role in our lives as artists. Isn't is I couldn't have imagined that. Um, I've been I've been buried in virtual oh. choir recordings. I've got a couple uh, orchestra con uh, um, possibilities coming up. It's become such an interesting um, platform to learn the technology, to master the technology, to apply it to our practice. It's quite a ride. Yeah, and it's a learning process, as you said, uh, but I think this is going to be something that we'll, we'll continue to do even after the uh, pandemic is over. Um, we'll be able to use social media in a totally new way for artists and to be able to, you know, spread out, spread the word out to the world uh, what, we're, what we're made of. What we, One we thing have, I've learned in my offer. experience is that um, that there's always artists always find a way to be creative, um, no matter the time, no matter the period. If you look back at the Middle Ages in the 1350s, you had Guillaume de Fay, who was um, who was very careful about he was petrified of the plague and he sequestered himself away. And when he got hired as the music director of Notre Dame Cathedral, he brought his uh, Besa de Notre Dame to the, the cathedral as his homage and that was the first time they'd ever set a five movement mass in one complete musical setting so artists innovate in isolation so i think we're going to see an explosion of new collaborations compositions and just in general an explosion of new ideas what do you think about that i'm i'm all for that 100 as a matter of fact i was in the middle of a two uh or practically unknown Spanish operas, not zarzuelas, which are actually spoken dialogue with music, but it's it's these are actual fully staged Spanish operas of one of Manuel de Falla and the other was in the Granados. And uh, before the pandemic uh, took uh, took hold, so uh, I took that time to actually get the score, the manuscript score of the of the Granados. And I've been, I actually took advantage of the time to actually complete it in a professional style uh, task, uh, but I was able to accomplish it. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be something that's going to be, uh, that we're going to be able to utilize to its fullest. Well, there's lots of time to put together because together with the time we have sequestered. There's time to really dig into that where it's a piece that's not done very often, that's not much in the Canada repertoire, and I think can really add something very special to the New York opera scene. Absolutely. And uh, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more software applications being created, uh, you know, besides, uh, you know, you have Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, uh, uh, I think there's something called Zamcam uh, as well, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot more that are going to be able to utilize the, this and to uh, be able to uh, use music in uh, totally innovative ways. It, I think this is going to be the 21st century uh well, Francisco, I want to thank you for being a guest on our show tonight. Um, it's always wonderful to uh, interact with artists who are out there thinking, who are out there planning their next step despite this, um, these, these times where we find ourselves isolated and alone. You're um, moving forward as an artist and you're advancing, and I, feel, I look forward to that, um, that next chapter as we emerge. Happy May again. So thank you for joining us for our first broadcast of Music Matters 2020 with Jason Tram. I wish you well and keep music alive. Good night.